Hi, and welcome to Assertive Communication, Build the Independent You. I am Lucia Grossaru, and I am the author of the Psychology Corner blog. In the following lectures, I will show you how to use the assertive communication style in order to live a more authentic and independent life. Thoughts, emotions, and behaviors that rely on the assertive principles allow you to break free from toxic contexts and focus on your own personal and professional goals. This course is for you if you want to learn how to guide your thinking in a way that boosts your confidence and self-esteem and that allows you to regulate your emotions better. Learn how to build healthier relationships. Communicate your opinions openly. Deal with criticism and conflict efficiently. Say no and create time for the goals that truly matter to you. Participate in this course if you want to regain confidence in your inner power to create the future you want. Start building the independent you right now. Activate your inner resources and engage in this process of change and growth. If you are ready to make the first steps toward your cognitive, emotional, and social independence, then join me in the next lecture. Critical Thinking and Assertiveness Advocate Perhaps this is what best describes my social role and interests. My cognitive structure, which is primarily analytic, as well as my psychology training and social observations have led me to strongly believe that the path toward individual, social, and global growth is through unbiased, evidence-based thinking and an attitude toward the self and others based on mutual respect, consideration, and support. I believe that critical thinking and assertiveness can be the foundation of a better future, accelerated scientific progress, and a truly functional global society. In the last years, I've helped individuals achieve independence of thought, a higher level of psychological well-being, and offered them assistance in creating the lifestyle which best fits their authentic selves. My results and those of others increased my confidence that we can build an impressive world by empowering individuals to be authentic and act in accordance with their inner potential shifting from an external to an internal sense of control and meaning can be the step we all need to allow ourselves to be who we really are. And I believe that the foundation for that shift lies in critical thinking and assertiveness skills. I think we can rely on these complex concepts and processes when creating our present and future reality. I believe that powerful, independent individuals will build a powerful and wonderful world. In this course, I will address both theoretical and practical aspects needed to create and activate the assertive style of communication. We could just skip to the assertive techniques and strategies, and that will probably be enough to project the image of an assertive person in the social world, and maybe even gain some of the benefits related to this communication style. But I think that the best approach is a multidimensional one in which we simultaneously address thinking patterns, the understanding of how these patterns shape our emotions, and ultimately, how to project these inner events into observable behaviors, such as verbal and nonverbal communication, and the overall management of social relationships. We will first take a look at what assertiveness is, the reasons why you should learn this complex skill, its benefits, and when to use it. Then we will zoom in on each of the five communication styles, so that you will be able to identify them in yourself and others. We will then address the assertive rights, or assertive principles, and that will mark the passage to the practical part of this course. You will learn how to identify and eliminate the main cognitive distortions, and how thoughts and emotions are linked in the assertive realm. Then we will get to the really interesting part, the actual techniques and strategies of the assertive style of communication. 
you will learn how to communicate in a more authentic and confident manner, how to efficiently deal with criticism and conflict, how to provide constructive feedback, and how to make sure that your verbal message matches the nonverbal one. And then you will be ready to go. The foundation for the independent you would have been laid and you will have the main skills to start creating the life you want. Shall we? Assertiveness refers to the complex ability to think, emotionally react, and act in a way that is non-passive and non-aggressive. A primarily assertive person is able to openly express their opinions, feelings, needs, and desires in a way that is respectful of their rights and the rights of others. Perhaps you've heard about assertiveness mainly in contexts that regard communication styles, but that is just one side of this complex concept. My view and the one that I will be using throughout the course is that assertiveness is a multidimensional concept. It is simultaneously a set of skills, a communication style, and a type of behavior. The set of skills involves cognitive, emotional, and behavioral elements. You think, manage your emotions, and act in an assertive way. The communication style refers to using assertive verbal and nonverbal techniques and strategies in your social interactions. At the same time, it includes the regulation of your inner speech. This is also communication but this time it's directed toward yourself. The assertive behavior means being able to generally act in ways that project the assertive principles and traits. These concepts overlap and draw on the same basic ideas. We will learn more about assertive thinking, behaviors, and how to communicate in an assertive manner, but for now, just keep in mind that assertiveness is about gaining the ability to be authentic and act according to your own values and goals, while at the same time, respecting the rights of others to be themselves and act according to their values and goals. It's about the non-passive, non-aggressive you. What can assertiveness do for you? Why invest time and other resources in mastering this complex skill? Well. To create a complete list of benefits generated by a primarily assertive lifestyle would be impossible, considering all the nuances of human behavior, potential, and goals. But here is why I think you should learn to be more assertive in your thinking and in your actions. It's because it would allow you to become more independent by living a more authentic life, boost your confidence and self-esteem levels, Initiate and build healthier relationships and break free from toxic influences. You can create opportunities for yourself and others. You learn to say no and create time for the goals that matter to you. It will help you increase your resistance to manipulation. You will be able to manage your emotions better. You can learn how to deal with criticism and conflict in a more efficient manner and learn how to provide constructive feedback. You will be able to use assertiveness to confidently approach your personal and professional goals. Promote yourself and showcase your abilities. Break free from passive or aggressive communication patterns. And the list could go on and on. Most likely you will add your own observed benefits to the list while participating in this course and implementing the techniques. It is my conviction that investing time in learning how to be assertive and how to use this complex skill to achieve your goals, it's time well spent. It positively changes the individual and, in the end, has the power to positively change society. And if you believe, just like I do, that the future of a fully functional and happy society is through knowledge, mutual respect and support, then you will join me in this endeavor of change and growth.
In this lecture, I will share with you when to use the assertive communication techniques and, just as important, when not to use them. So, please make sure that you watch this lecture till the end. So, when it comes to when to use the assertive communication style, the answer is in basically every segment of your life. From your inner dynamic, which includes thoughts, inner speech and emotion regulation, to the external expression of these inner events, such as verbal and nonverbal communication and other behaviors, assertiveness can help you have a more balanced and satisfying lifestyle. Assertive communication can be used to manage both your personal and professional interactions and goals. At a personal level, you can use it to improve your relationships with your family, friends, and romantic partners. Use it whenever you want to confidently state your opinion, in public speaking and educational settings, when you want to ask someone to do something, and to address unreasonable requests. Professionally, use the assertive communication style to deal with business meetings, negotiations, job interviews, and, in general, to become a better colleague and leader. A word of caution. Most daily contexts are fit for an assertive approach. But there are also situations in which the assertive strategies are not recommended and can even escalate the conflict. If you find yourself in a violent relationship, regardless of where this violence comes from, Others may act violently toward you, or you yourself may have a history of violence. Then do not use the techniques presented in this course or in any other materials on assertiveness to directly address that situation. In these cases, please contact a professional to help you deal with this issue in a specialized manner. Assertiveness training may be part of the process but it is not the proper way to directly address violent situations. So, please seek the proper assistance if you are dealing with a violent context. Thank you for watching the lecture till the end. It is important to me to fully convey this message. In this lecture, we will take a general look at the five communication styles, and later on, we will take our time to individually address each of them so that at the end of this section, you will be able to identify their specific traits in yourself and others. So, let's start by naming the five communication styles that we will be working with in this course. We will talk about three main styles, the passive, the aggressive, and the assertive style. One mixed style, passive-aggressive, and a secondary style, manipulative. In different materials about communication, you may find variations in the way the author or instructor refers to these styles. Sometimes they may only address the main three styles, or only four of them, or maybe they have another approach altogether. But for the purpose of this course, we will use these five styles to describe the main ways in which we behave and communicate. Now let's see how they relate to each other. I will illustrate this. Let's imagine a line segment. A simple line with these endpoints. Let's imagine that on this line, we would be able to fit all types of communication and their respective variations. If we were to represent any variation of a person's behavior, we would be able to place it on this line. Now, in this case, the left end point on our line would signify the purest form of passive behavior. This form does not exist in reality, but we will use it for training purposes. So here, on the far left, we would have the passive style of behavior and communication. The passive style means that a person using it would rather renounce their own rights, desires, and needs in favor of the rights, desires, and needs of others. In total opposition, at the end point to our right, we would have the purest form of aggressive behavior. 
that would mean that the person using it would mainly care about their own rights, desires, and needs, and disregard the rights, desires, and needs of others. To represent a balanced attitude toward our own rights and those of others, we would use the exact middle point of this line segment. This would be the purest form of assertive behavior. This is what assertiveness is, the imaginary place where our rights and the rights of others coexist in harmony. None of them is infringed upon or disregarded. Now let's place the remaining two styles in our illustration. When our inner dynamic is rather aggressive, but the social expression mimics passive behaviors, that means that the passive-aggressive style is being used. Any combination of passive and aggressive elements defines this specific style. And somewhere between the assertive style and the aggressive one, depending on the level of aggressiveness involved, we have the manipulative style. Remember that none of these pure forms of behavior or communication exist in real life, but to be able to work with these concepts, an illustration like this one comes in handy. We could even assign numbers to this line and think of it as a behavioral scale. It would only be a convention, but it does help self-assessment. Let's say that the left end point is equal to zero and that the right one is a hundred. That would give the middle point a value of 50. One could now think about their behavior and the behavior of others using these values and place each variation on this imaginary scale. I could say that during that week when I said yes to all of my colleagues' requests to take over tasks that were originally assigned to them, on top of dealing with my own tasks, I was rather passive, a 23 maybe. When I finally got the courage to say, I am sorry, but I will only be able to help you once my tasks are completed, then maybe that would be closer to a 45, or if I've said it really confidently, a 55. If I would have said something along the lines of, you're a jerk, stop asking me to do your job, then maybe that would be an 80, because it would be an aggressive response. But these are all subjective assessments. Nonetheless, they are useful, since we could track our behavior and perhaps use this information to regulate it. But in reality, these endpoints do not exist at all. Behaviors flow on a continuum. And professionals would not even use a line's middle point to illustrate assertiveness, but instead use a triangle to showcase how behavioral styles relate to one another. They are different standalone things. We create the relation just to be able to operate with the concepts. There is no perfect balance between aggressiveness and passivity. Furthermore, in our daily interactions, we do not use a single behavioral or communication style. We use a combination of them. Depending on the context, we select and activate one of the five styles. The style that we use the most is what we will refer to as the predominant, main, or primary style. But the other styles will show up as well. Levels of each of them already reside in us. We already are passive, aggressive, and assertive. We just need to activate a predominant style that proves to best serve our interests and goals. And that style is so far considered to be assertiveness. We won't be able to be assertive all the time, but if our inner dynamic and our main behaviors are primarily guided by the assertive principles, then we should benefit from all the great effects assertiveness holds. Now let's zoom in on each of the five styles of communication. See you in the next lecture. As we've seen earlier, the passive style of communication mainly means renouncing your own rights in favor of others. This style is also known as submissive. Since the persons who are primarily passive often renounce expressing their opinions or emotions 
and would rather help others achieve their goals instead of working on their own. This style is seen as an expression of low self-esteem. The main beliefs or thoughts associated with the passive style include the idea that one is inferior to others, less worthy and less skilled, that others are more important than they are, that other people have the right to control their own lives, but they themselves would not be capable of proving such skills. That is mainly why they give control over their lives to others. They rather see themselves as followers, not leaders. When it comes to communication, people who are primarily passive do not openly express their opinions or emotions. They would rather agree with what others are saying or formulate an opinion that is similar to theirs. If they do decide to voice their opinion, they would avoid talking first, since they need to validate it by comparing it to the opinion of others. They avoid offering negative feedback because they want to avoid conflict by all means. They fear being socially rejected and would rather renounce their own rights and sacrifice their own goals than lose social connections. The tone of their voice is soft and they often are unnecessarily apologetic. They avoid direct visual contact and often look downward. We may think that passive behaviors are mainly about being inactive, but that is not valid. Passive individuals may engage in activities of high intensity, but what keeps them in the passive, submissive category is the direction of their actions. These activities are rather oriented toward achieving the goals of others and defending their rights. As I've said previously, Primarily passive individuals would rather follow than lead. Their attitude usually shows low levels of confidence, and it's rather one marked by humility. Their posture conveys the same message. Hunched back, head leaning forward. It's like they are trying to occupy as little physical space as possible. It goes with the belief that they are small and frail, while others are seen as big and strong. Emotionally, it's negative emotions that mainly define the passive style. Confusion, helplessness, frustration and resentment are often experienced by a passive or submissive individual. There are also some positive emotions connected to the passive style of communication and behavior. The most significant is feeling safe, a result that is linked to social acceptance and low levels of conflict and responsibility. The advantages of the passive style of communication and behavior include the few positive emotions, but also the fact that the person is usually seen as a pleasant company rather than a threat, which makes social interactions smoother. The disadvantages are many, among them feelings of anxiety or depression. Also, because the social image of the passive person is usually that of a victim, people may take advantage of their nature. Their limits are rarely respected and they rarely manage to achieve any of their significant goals. Although in some situations, the passive style of communication may turn out to be useful, most of the time it only generates dissatisfaction and frustration. Primarily aggressive individuals see their rights, opinions, and needs as being more important than those of others. Their actions often infringe on the rights of other people. They are almost exclusively dedicated to the accomplishment of their own goals, usually at the expense of the interests of other people. Their strategies and communication methods are often exaggerated disproportional and are activated at inappropriate times. This style is also seen as the expression of low levels of self-esteem and self-confidence. This is why primarily aggressive individuals try to compensate by projecting a social image of superiority and overconfidence. 
primarily aggressive people usually think of themselves as being more powerful and stronger than others. In their mind, they're better, no matter the assessment criterion. They see themselves as deserving and skilled and as having the right to control their own life as well as the lives of others. They are important. Others are considered unimportant. They think that they should always be in charge and lead, while others should follow them. Aggressive communicators openly express their opinions, emotions, and wants, but do it in such a way that disregards the opinions, emotions, and wants of others. They are not skilled listeners, and this is why they often fail to create satisfying connections with others. They often offer unjustified criticism. Their feedback is meant to put the other person down, not to help them better themselves or help the relationship grow. Because they see conflict in almost every context, they see communication as a situation in which they have to win. And to achieve that goal, they tend to dominate conversations. They speak loudly, usually covering up the voices of others, in the hope that this puts them in a leading position. They threaten, bully, humiliate, and blame others for their own mistakes or failures. They initiate and maintain conflict, manifest little or no empathy or understanding for other people, and they are usually not affected by the fact that they may cause negative effects on others. The visual contact is direct, but confrontational. They may blink rarely or not at all for prolonged periods of time. Almost all of their actions exclusively serve their own goals. They will try to make sure that their rights are respected by others, while they themselves barely respect any rights. They would even claim auxiliary, unreasonable rights, just to try to maintain control over others. They usually want things to turn out their way, and do not accept the views of others. They want to be seen as leaders, and think they are entitled to top social and professional roles. They are usually impulsive, their body posture is dominant and is often used as a tool of intimidation. We may think that the emotional life of an aggressive person must consist mainly of positive feelings because of their roles that involve power and control and getting what they want most of the time, but that is not the case. As I've said earlier, aggressive traits stem from low self-esteem and confidence levels. As a result, the main emotion for the aggressive person is fear. Fear of losing control, especially the control they have over others. And their control is always at stake, especially when it's their over-aggressive actions that give clues about their weaknesses. They don't feel dominant. They instead feel helpless, abused, and consider that others require unreasonable things from them. Their aggressive reaction is almost always a response to a perceived threat, real or not. The result of the aggressive action makes them feel in control once more, and also provides them with other positive feelings, but only for a short amount of time. New contexts that test their sense of control or other attributes that they consider important will make them feel fear again, and that will cause them once more to resort to the aggressive pattern of action unless they create and activate an alternative type of response. People who only occasionally resort to aggressive patterns of action may also feel guilt or embarrassment for having caused negative effects in the life of another person. The advantages of the aggressive style of communication include the positive range of emotions they may feel for a short while, the perceived sense of control, and the apparent validation of their desired skills and social roles. This perceived well-being is often a superficial one because the underlying beliefs and emotions have not been yet efficiently managed and alternative ways to think and act are not yet available to these persons. The disadvantages of the aggressive style 
refer to the inefficient management of one's authentic beliefs and emotions, the negative social reactions they often receive, such as rejection, content, and hate, and the escalation of conflicts and their various consequences. In the long run, the aggressive style of communication proves to be an ineffective way to deal with professional and personal contexts. This mixed style of communication combines elements from the passive and aggressive styles. The result is an apparent passive surface that is actually an attempt to hide authentic aggressive feelings. The person may experience emotions related to the aggressive style, such as anger, dissatisfaction, or resentment, but wants to avoid the consequences of openly expressing them and the associated opinions. The person desires the effects of the anger they feel towards someone or something, but they make a choice of avoiding the possible negative outcome by not expressing it directly. They will instead use indirect ways to undermine the goals, well-being, and relationships of another person. Here are some examples of passive-aggressive behavior. Forget someone's birthday or an anniversary. Having a headache at the exact moment when you have to help someone in a way that is meaningful to them, like babysitting their child so they can go to the restaurant or the movies. Solving a task in a less than satisfying manner, so that somebody else has to take over. Being repeatedly late to business meetings, or meetings with certain friends. These behaviors activate in relation to the people toward whom you feel anger or other negative emotions. Of course, some of these problems may be genuine, and at times it may become difficult to discriminate between real causes and the passive-aggressive reaction. This leads us to a valid question. How do we make the difference between the two? A way to guide this analysis is the attitude we have toward the negative result we're causing and the associated emotions. Are you feeling any sort of satisfaction that the other one isn't getting what they want? that they have to stay at home because they cannot find another babysitter soon enough, that they have to stay overtime to complete the tasks you didn't finish, that they have to give some explanations to the boss because they maybe recommended you for the job. Do you feel that now you're even? That you've gotten your revenge? Are you acting in this way with a certain frequency? These are all clues that passive-aggressive behaviors may be the answer to those contexts. Remember that when it comes to the passive-aggressive style, it is all about the passive surface hiding authentic aggressive intentions. Emotionally, the passive-aggressive style combines the emotions related to the passive and aggressive styles. Negative emotions and inner events include anxiety, low self-esteem, lowered sense of control over one's own life, guilt, and being ashamed. Positive emotions, such as the satisfaction you get from the fact that you think you've gotten even or the relief of dodging responsibility, are once again short-lived. The advantages of the passive-aggressive style are rather few. In addition to the positive emotions I've mentioned earlier, one may find comfort in the fact that it is easier to justify passive-aggressive actions than direct aggressive behaviors and at the same time, responsibility and consequences can be easily avoided. The disadvantages of the passive-aggressive communication style include the negative emotions associated with the passive-aggressive actions, but also the lack of authenticity and openness, and the fact that other people may see this person as irresponsible, disorganized, unskilled, and as expressing no consideration for others. At the same time, the consequences that have been avoided through passive-aggressive actions may be activated if the deceiving behavior is discovered. Because it relies on two rather ineffective communication styles, the passive-aggressive style is also, most of the time, 
inefficient in regulating one's relationships and inner dynamics. While the passive-aggressive style is a mixed style of communication, the manipulative style is rather a subtype of the aggressive type. We will refer to it as a secondary style. The main characteristic of this communication style resides in the intention of the person using it, to modify somebody else's thoughts, opinions, emotions and behaviors, to serve their own goals. It is easy to identify the fact that this kind of intention infringes upon the rights of others. Manipulation is used either to unnecessarily protect one's rights through aggressive means, or to create the impression that the manipulator is entitled to additional rights that apply only to him or her, but not to others. The underlying beliefs of a primarily manipulative person may include the following. I will do everything in my power to make things go my way. Whether I deserve it or not, I will make sure that the outcome will favor me. You can easily spot the basic aggressive attitude that says that this person's rights and goals must be more important than those of other people. Manipulative communicators will convey any message, authentic or not, that has the potential to serve their goals and will often ignore the negative effects their actions may have on others. Skilled manipulators will often mix authentic facts with false information to make others accept their views easier. Nonverbal cues may also be modified to make the intended message seem authentic. Manipulative behaviors aim at convincing others to participate in the fulfillment of the manipulator's goals. The manipulation may be disguised as a neutral or positive intention, and it may seem to have no aggressive component. In this case, the target or victim may decide to willingly participate in the manipulator's plan. Manipulation may also be openly aggressive and make the victim consider that they have no other option but to do what the manipulator requests. This view may be valid or not depending on the context, but nonetheless, the victim will often react and act as if they have no other choice but to comply with the manipulator's requests. A primarily manipulative person may even convince others to renounce their own rights in order to protect his or hers. Social interactions with a primarily manipulative person usually have a win-lose structure. The manipulator wins, the victim loses. When the potential wins cease to exist, the manipulator may try to find a different victim. They can also significantly alter their entire appearance and observable personality traits so that they will increase their chances to successfully manipulate victims. The emotions experienced by a person who primarily uses the manipulative style of communication may vary greatly, depending on the context and their goals but they are mainly those feelings encountered in the aggressive style as well. They may also feign the expression of various emotions to trigger specific reactions in others. Depending on their aim, they can trigger supportive reactions, compassion, but also rejection and anger. For manipulators who mainly rely on this style for the management of both their personal and professional lives, there may be many positive emotional rewards, at least until they get caught, but for the occasional manipulator, guilt and embarrassment are activated more often. It is easy to see that the main advantages of the manipulative style come from the various results of the manipulative actions. The benefits may occur in both personal and professional contexts. They may get the job they want, project the desired social image, and get the emotional rewards related to the success of their actions. They may even experience a temporary boost in their self-esteem and confidence levels. But the disadvantages of the manipulative communication style are far more extensive than its advantages, even when manipulation is successful most of the time. When manipulation is the primary guide for one's social image and social interactions, 
their own self-identity may become distorted, unarticulated, and it may become very difficult to restore its authentic version. Authenticity is lost in all relationships, including the one with your own person. If others catch on to the manipulator strategies, those relationships may be beyond repair, and they may trigger rejection or aggressive responses. Many times, when the manipulative strategies are discovered by others, most or all of the benefits previously gained are lost. In the long run, the manipulative style of communication turns out to be inefficient, especially as a primary style, because it does not generate long-lasting, authentic results. What one builds through manipulation may be taken away from them in a split second. And often, that is exactly what happens. The main goal of this course to create and activate the assertive style of communication as your primary style of communication. The mindset and behaviors that make up the assertive style are considered to provide the most efficient management for both personal and professional life contexts. To communicate assertively means to express your thoughts, emotions, and wants in a direct, open, and authentic manner, and at the same time, display consideration for the thoughts, emotions, and wants of others. You claim your rights and, at the same time, respect the rights of other people. In assertive relationships, boundaries are clearly set and respected. We know what is comfortable and acceptable to us and how to request that our limits be respected. Being assertive does not always get you the outcome you want but it helps you stay focused on your significant and reasonable goals. When you are primarily assertive, you know that you are in control of your own life and that others have the right and skills to control their own lives as well. And you would never intend to modify that. Assertive people take responsibility for their actions and they also understand the limit of this responsibility. They adapt easily to diverse social, personal, and professional environments because their empathy, listening skills, and mainly rational thinking patterns allow them to connect with others and develop healthy relationships. They can accept opinions that are different from theirs, knowing at the same time that they have the right not to agree with those opinions. They are also willing to change their opinions about things if presented with relevant data that support new conclusions. Assertive people take an active role in making the changes they want in their lives and do their best to accomplish their goals. The assertive style of communication is seen as related to high levels of self-esteem and confidence. That shows both in their inner and social dynamics. They can appreciate someone else's skills while at the same time being aware of their own strengths and vulnerabilities. They accept and support diversity. Underlying thoughts and beliefs that are linked to the assertive style of communication include the following. I am deserving and so are others. Both myself and others are important. Depending on the context, we can all be leaders or followers. Assertive communication places authenticity, honesty, and openness at the core of successful communication. It is about openly saying what you think, feel, or want, making reasonable requests, refusing unreasonable ones, being able to give and receive constructive feedback, and also the ability to effectively deal with conflict and criticism. Assertive communicators take both their rights and the rights of others into account. The tone of their voice is balanced, calm, and conveys confidence. Conflict is not necessarily avoided, but it is managed in a constructive, objective way, without allowing it to escalate into violence. 
The visual contact is mainly direct, but in order to not make it seem confrontational, it will be interrupted by occasional horizontal eye movements. The assertive behavior is mainly represented by actions that are in agreement with one's opinions, beliefs, emotions, values, and goals, and do not infringe on the rights of others. They convey consideration for the opinions, beliefs, emotions, values, and goals of others. These actions are mainly oriented toward one's own goals, but they can be activated to support the goals of others as well. If the assertive person chooses to do so, then they are aware that that is a choice they make, not the result of manipulation or aggressiveness. The physical appearance and body posture of a primarily assertive person convey confidence, comfort, openness, and most of all, are in accordance with the person's inner dynamic. There is a natural flow between what goes on in one's mind and emotional realm and what is socially displayed through verbal and nonverbal communication. Assertive people find it comfortable to display an authentic social image of themselves. They take responsibility for it and update it according to the changes that occur in their inner dynamic. They are also respectful of the physical space of others and make sure that their physical space is also respected. Emotionally, the assertive style of communication promotes and maintains a satisfying level of physical and psychological well-being. Because the inner dynamic is carefully analyzed, understood, and improved if needed, this also sets the basis for healthy and long-lasting social relationships. Assertive individuals have the cognitive and emotional skills to deal with stress, conflict, criticism, and inner conflicts in an effective way. They maintain good levels of self-esteem and confidence and successfully manage unpleasant emotions, such as anxiety. Their sense of control and direction in life allows them to experience lower intensities of these negative emotions. Fewer situations in which they feel helpless or confused also lead to fewer emotions in the range of depression. Also, it is important to mention here that primarily assertive persons accept uncertainty in their lives. They understand that there are situations beyond our control, contexts that we cannot change, and in which we need to act in ways that limit unnecessary inner conflicts and associated negative effects upon ourselves and others. The main advantages of the assertive style of communication have been addressed in a previous lecture, but to those benefits, I will add here the following. The ability to be present in your life. We will take from the past what we need to grow, but let go of everything else so that it won't negatively interfere with our present or future. The ability to set realistic, reasonable goals, to make relevant plans, and to act in accordance with those plans. The ability to connect with others in an authentic, honest way that will help both individuals and relationships grow. Also, an advantage of the assertive style of communication is to boost and maintain self-esteem and confidence levels. The disadvantages of the assertive style are few but we need to address them. As I mentioned in a previous lecture, there are contexts in which it is not recommended to use the assertive methods, among them violent relationships. I will repeat here that if you find yourself in a violent relationship, then you should not try to address it through methods such as the ones included in this course, and instead contact a professional who can help you create a valid and safe strategy to deal with that particular context. Using assertive strategies in violent contexts may trigger aggressive responses and severe consequences, so please make sure that you are safe and get the appropriate assistance to find the solutions for your particular situation. This being said, we also need to consider the fact that many of our daily interactions do not involve primarily assertive individuals. So, we will interact with various types of people, and guess what? Not everyone is a fan of assertiveness. 
assertive communication does not guarantee assertive responses from other individuals. It facilitates them, and you may be able to manage many of your interactions with difficult individuals through the assertive methods, but there are times when they can trigger resistance and even backlash. A primarily passive individual may see you as being too direct, disengaged, or even cold and selfish. This may be mainly because they think that one should not act in their own interest, that saying things openly may lead to social rejection, and that by doing that you're basically one step closer to conflict, and as we've seen previously, they avoid conflict by not openly stating their opinions or wants. At the same time, aggressive persons may feel their sense of control threatened by assertive individuals who know and confidently claim their rights. This may sometimes cause backlash with the intention to re-establish the desired authority of the aggressive individual. Others may even see you as narcissistic and boastful, just because you can confidently talk about your strengths. And examples can go on, because it is not always easy to interact as an assertive individual who mainly resorts to critical thinking with primarily passive, aggressive, or irrational structures. But you need to keep in mind that although these interactions may not be pleasant and may trigger some frustration on your part, especially if you're just starting to learn how to be assertive, the reactions of others are not your responsibility, but theirs. You nonetheless have to deal with them assertively. Don't let them overwhelm you emotionally or manipulate you into activating aggressive patterns as well. These reactions barely have anything to do with you. They belong to the individuals displaying them. Your responsibility is not to infringe upon somebody else's rights, but it is not to make them happy or give them what they want. Beyond that, it's about them, their choices, their responsibilities. We need to be responsible of our actions and the delivery of our messages so that our intentions are visible and well understood. If we manage to adapt the message to our goals and the specific contexts and relationships, then the main factors of assertive interactions have been established. When you move toward a primarily assertive style of communication and behavior, you need to be ready to accept that some of your previous relationships may not survive the change. Assertive individuals break free from toxic relationships, and that may cause different levels of psychological and emotional discomfort in the initial stages. If you feel high levels of discomfort while going through these significant changes, then please seek the help of a professional to make the transition easier and to address any underlying psychological events that are active and play a role in that specific situation. This course can guide you to make most of the basic changes to create and activate a primarily assertive style of communication, but please assess carefully your individual situation, and if you think you need a more in-depth approach to address the difficulties you're going through, then consider one-on-one -on -one life counseling or psychotherapy sessions to help you deal with that context. Despite its occasional disadvantages, the assertive style of communication is the most efficient set of communication skills available to us that can help us regulate our inner dynamic as well as manage our personal and professional relationships. Do not feel intimidated. I imagine that at this point in the course, some of you may think that making all of these changes may be hard and you may even feel like quitting. That's a normal reaction. Changes, and especially significant changes, are not easy to accomplish, but the results are worth it. You deserve to be free in your thinking, your emotions, and your actions. You deserve to have healthy, long-lasting relationships and to accomplish your goals. You deserve to feel comfortable being you, and there's a way that can facilitate all of this. Whether you see yourself as primarily passive or aggressive at this point, now that you have the resources to make such an assessment, and want to create your main assertive skills from scratch 
or if you think of yourself as a primarily assertive person who needs some guidance on how to activate and boost their assertive skills, then the following lectures can help you achieve these goals. Change is a step-by-step -step process, and the first one is to decide to begin. You've already made that step. I encourage you to continue and see what assertiveness has in store for you. Let your personal results guide your informed opinion about which style of communication and behavior best fits your inner structure and personal and professional goals. It's about personal experiences, and I encourage you not to deny yours. See you in the next lecture. To claim and protect your rights as well as respect the rights of others when it comes to communication, you first of all need to know what these rights are. If you are familiar with personal development articles and books, you may have encountered such lists of assertive rights before. They may have comprised of 10 items or 7 items or any other number of items. There is no definite list. This list is subjective and each trainer or communication specialist may agree to some view or another or create their own list. But basically, these rights need to express, in terms of liberties, the assertive principles. But they are mainly based on the human rights that apply to all of us. We just place them in contexts of communication or relationships. And it would be really difficult to come up with a definite list of such rights, considering that there are so many fields of knowledge trying to figure this whole thing out. Some things are still under discussion at philosophical levels. Others are still highly debated in legal contexts. So we just do our best to provide a set of principles that can guide the way toward our legitimate freedom, our authenticity, and our well-being and that at the same time reflect respect and cause no harm to other beings or the environment that offers us all our basic resources. So here is my list of assertive rights that I primarily consider in communication contexts. I will use numbers for each of them just to have a better structure for this part of the lecture, but there is no particular order or hierarchy between these statements. You are entitled to your own beliefs, values, and the associated emotions. You have the right to act in accordance with your beliefs, values, and associated emotions, as long as you do not deliberately seek to hurt others. You have the right to assess your own thoughts, values, emotions, and behaviors, and take upon yourself the full responsibility for their expression and consequences. You have the right to decide upon your implication in actions that benefit others. You have the right to offer no justification or apology for your actions. You have the right to make mistakes and take responsibility for them. You don't have to be perfect. You have the right to be irrational and make decisions based on irrational reasoning. You have the right to disagree with others. You are entitled to different opinions. You have the right to be respected as an individual. You have the right to display your skills and benefit from the results of your work. You have the right to say no to the requests of others. No justification, no guilt. You have the right to formulate your own goals and choose your own priorities. You have the right to change your mind, your opinions, and your beliefs. You have the right to say, I don't know and I do not understand. You have the right to be independent. As I was saying previously, this list does not include all the rights and principles that are associated with the assertive views, but I consider these items to be the main guidelines for assertive communication and behaviors. Feel free to consider each of these rights in the context of your own life. Do they seem valid to you? Do you claim them all, most of them, few, none? 
would you add any other new assertive right to the list? You can revisit this question at the end of the course as well. Now let's move on to addressing the connection between our reasoning and assertiveness and how this connection helps us better regulate our emotions. The way in which we create our mental image about ourselves and the outside world greatly influences our choices when it comes to goals, actions, and options for social interactions. That is why when developing assertiveness skills, we need to make sure that we base the creation of these images on a satisfying amount of relevant information that will allow the rational features to overwhelm the irrational ones. The goal is to ultimately connect to a reality that is as close to being valid and authentic as human abilities allow. In this course, we will address two aspects that are related to the analysis and orientation of cognitive processes in a way that facilitates the creation, assimilation, and expression of assertive attributes. We cannot become primarily assertive in behavior and communication unless we develop and activate a primarily assertive mindset. This mindset will also help us regulate our emotions better. So, in the next lecture, we will address the connection between our thinking patterns and emotions, and in the following section, I will show you how to identify, analyze, and eliminate the basic cognitive distortions. Between our thoughts, our emotions, and the external world, there is a continuous interaction. The external world influences the way we think and feel, and our thoughts and emotions influence the image we have of this world. We will build our inner world, which includes the image we hold about ourselves and others, based on the emotional reactions and beliefs that we have acquired about the external world. Thus, it becomes important to maintain a balance when it comes to our beliefs and emotions so that the inner world we create for ourselves would be able to offer the resources we need for our personal development, to limit the context in which we can be overwhelmed by our emotions, to ensure a satisfying level of rational thinking patterns, and to also help us guide our social interactions in an effective way. We base our everyday decisions on our beliefs and our emotional reactions to both the external and the internal world. So it becomes necessary for us to understand what exactly influences our decision-making processes. It is important for us to understand how we function at the cognitive level and how we react emotionally to different situations in order to ensure the efficacy of our decisions. It is sometimes difficult to see and accept that our thoughts and emotions are the main hurdles on the way toward the achievement of our goals and well-being. That is why it becomes necessary to become intentional thinkers and analyze our cognitive and emotional patterns and try to understand the causes, the triggers, and the methods through which we can modify these patterns, should we desire to achieve that. This outcome can be achieved through different methods of analysis, self-guided or guided by a professional. For the purpose of this online course, in this lecture I will address the first step of such an analysis, differentiating thoughts from emotions. Some people may find it easy to identify and express their emotions, while others may struggle to both identify and express them. When one cannot properly differentiate between their thoughts and emotions or isolate a certain emotion or thought in order to analyze it, then their endeavors to develop critical reasoning or authentic assertive functioning may become unsuccessful. Treating thoughts as emotions or considering an emotion as a sufficient argument to make an informed decision may cause difficulties in developing an authentic, reason-driven, assertive mindset. A way to simplify this complex process is to be able to name our emotions and identify their triggers. 
naming emotions allows further analysis and is an important part of assertive communication. How does assertiveness help with emotion regulation, you may ask yourself at this point in the course. In this case as well, there's an ongoing interaction between our thoughts and emotions. Understanding our emotional triggers may help us both identify and modify the style of communication we activate in certain contexts. They give us information that can guide our actions, but at the same time, we need to be aware and not consider emotions as the exclusive factors in decision-making. That reasoning would cause us to lose important data that can be retrieved through rational cognitive analysis. Activating an assertive mindset and primarily resorting to assertive behaviors will regulate the intensity of our emotions and will ensure that this intensity fits the trigger and its significance for the individual. There will be fewer chances for you to feel emotionally overwhelmed in stressful situations or fail to act in a certain way because your emotions come in the way. In return, balanced emotional levels will facilitate critical thinking and the decision-making processes. In the next section, we will address the main cognitive distortions. Their management can greatly impact our emotional reactions to a variety of contexts and facilitate and support psychological and relational well-being. Cognitive distortions are errors that occur in one's reasoning, that modify the way we perceive reality. None of us is immune to these flaws of our cognitive processes. They are not signs of a weak mind, but of one that's been submitted to certain experiences that trigger these automated distorted thinking patterns. We refer to them as automated because they usually occur at levels that are out of our awareness. But carefully analyzing our thinking, our inner speech, may give us clues about the distortions that are active and have the power to influence our daily functioning. Shining a light on them allows us to change them with a rational thinking pattern and partially or completely eliminate their effects. Now, we do not yet know how to achieve reasoning that is completely free from bias or whether that is even possible but there are certain measures that we can take in order to identify, analyze, and eliminate the main distortions that influence the way we think about ourselves, others, and the world itself. In the following lectures, I will present to you what I consider to be the most significant distortions in our reasoning and how to manage them. This type of cognitive distortion is also known as polarized, black or white, or all or nothing thinking. When this type of reasoning is active, the person only considers the extreme points of a context, ignoring all the possible intermediary values. I will use the black or white thinking metaphor to illustrate this. Let's say we have this bar here, completely white for now. When dichotomous thinking occurs, the person would see the white square over here and the black square all the way here and consider that to be the applicable reality for that specific context. To them, this bar looks something like this. But it is pretty easy for us to realize that in between the white and black square, there are many values of gray. The reality is that of a gradient, ranging from the purest white to the blackest black, and includes all the intermediary values of gray in between. We miss that variety if we stick to black or white thinking. Examples of dichotomous views include the following. One could say that people are either good or bad, smart or stupid. Life is either a success or a failure. These messages fail to grasp the diversity, the numerous intermediary possibilities, and therefore create a distorted view of ourselves, others, and the world. Although there are contexts that fit a dichotomous description, most aspects of our lives do not. 
and at the same time the pure values of white or black can rarely, if ever, be achieved in real life. Most of the time there is some good in the bad and some bad in the good, so we should consider and accept the various values of grey. Observe whether you are limiting your views about a certain topic to only two opposing categories or values, and try to see whether there are intermediary segments that would describe them better. Now imagine that you would include all the aspects of a context, not in two, but in a single category that supports no exceptions. It would be like all the elements pertain to a group, and nothing else exists outside that group. That would mean to use overgeneralization. In communication, we recognize this type of cognitive distortion through the use of words such as always, never, all, everything, nothing. You can see that anything that would follow these terms would fall under the same category and would be expected to follow the same rule. Here are some examples. You never listen to me. All children love cotton candy. Everybody is a skilled communicator. As you can see, these formulations leave no room for exceptions. The reality portrayed by them is reduced to only one rule that seems to apply to every element of a general category. And unless objective measurements and observations say otherwise, that is not a valid view of the real world. More than likely, there have been moments when the other person listened to what you had to say. Some children do not enjoy cotton candy and not everybody communicates in an efficient manner. So it is reasonable to consider that most of the time, one single rule does not define a general complex context, and the rational thinker should be aware of that. Let's say you had a full day. This circle here is your day. All sorts of things happened. Some of your activities were successful. These colorful dots here. Some did not return the desired outcome, like these moments here. The mental filter distortion would mean, for example, to describe this day as being awful, because some of the things were less than perfect, or not what you expected them to be. You would completely filter the good things out of your day. Keep only the negative and define your day through those elements exclusively. Like this. Now, is this your day? Just by looking at the original illustration, you realize that saying that the big circle is completely covered in black dots would not be valid. Because here are the orange, yellow, and pink dots. We need to be aware of the various attributes of a situation, the many traits of a person, and the many characteristics of a relationship, and consider all of them when formulating a mental description. A rational thinking pattern takes into account all these aspects, their meaning, along with the perceived or proved value of that meaning. Regarding our circle here, we could say that the day has been mostly good, but it also included some undesirable elements. Have you ever caught yourself thinking or saying that your good results, at school or maybe at work, were just a matter of luck? That what got you the desired outcome was the fact that the teacher created an easy test or that your boss was nice to you and that is why he or she gave you the promotion. Well, in that case, the significant positive aspects related to those contexts have been considered to be a matter of hazard, fate, or destiny. What you're taking out of the real situation is your own effort and the skills that got you the good result. Sure, the items on a test and the good nature of your boss can be considered factors in relation to the outcomes presented but their participation in the result is rather low, 
in comparison to your efforts to study or to do your job well. So always pay attention to and acknowledge the role of significant factors that contribute to a certain outcome. Things don't just happen. There are reasons why a certain result occurs, and some of them are more important than others. Chances are that if something good happens in your life, it mainly has to do with your skills and actions, rather than some random situational factors. Take pride in that. This happens a lot in the irrational thinking realm, arriving at a conclusion through ways not supported by relevant data. It is actually a very important topic in the field of critical thinking. This distortion is responsible for many disputes in the academic world, but in the field of communication, we should pay attention to the two forms in which this cognitive distortion is expressed. Meaning, mind reading, or the reading of thoughts, and fortune-telling. Mind-reading means to believe that a person will act in a certain way in a certain context, when there is simply no data to support that conclusion. For example, I know the reason why I wasn't invited to the meeting yesterday is because my boss wanted to discuss my firing with the other board members. So, you would be reading your boss's mind when you have no previous data to support your conclusion that he or she wants to discuss about firing you with the other board members. You would react to the situation based on the distorted, imagined context. Fortune telling This time, it's not about what a person will do, but how things are actually going to happen in a given context. You project an outcome and consider it valid when you have no data to support your conclusion. For example, I know that my partner will end the relationship. There's no reason for me to remain as involved in this relationship as before. Here you can see the predicted outcome. The relationship will end. And also, you can observe where this distorted view leads to thoughts and actions that do not support the relationship anymore. So, most likely, in this context, you would end up participating in fulfilling the outcome you yourself erroneously predicted. Therefore, make sure that your conclusions are logically derived from your premises. To cognitively augment something, in the context of cognitive distortions, means to assign to certain attributes of a situation a higher significance than they have. One form of augmentation is catastrophic thinking, which refers to projecting the worst possible outcome for a given situation, totally ignoring all the other possibilities, which often are more likely to occur. For example, if your child is a little late from school, you could immediately think that they had a deadly accident and react as if that already happened. So, the worst-case scenario becomes your reality. Now, in some unfortunate contexts, that may be the case, but the probability of that outcome is rather low. It is more likely that they've just stopped to talk to a friend or to play with them, stopped to take photos, etc. Many other possibilities can explain them being late and we should consider them gradually, based on the data we have. This can spare us from feeling many types of negative and intense emotions. Minimization is the opposite of augmentation. This time, you don't emphasize meaning or significance, but rather diminish it drastically, close to its total disappearance at times, when the available data would lead to a different conclusion. So now you have the data, but choose to ignore it. For example, there's no reason for me to lock the front door. This is a safe neighborhood. Or it's not a big deal if I leave food by the tent. Bears aren't as dangerous as some people say. Data exists to let you know that there is always a risk involved with you not securing the entrance of your home. 
and bears have become dangerous for humans who do not take minimum safety measures when camping outdoors. You can see how minimization would create a false mental environment and would cause you to not take the necessary actions in a given situation. With augmentation, you overreact. With minimization, you underreact. Try to find a balance between the data that is available to you in a certain context and the results of your decision-making processes. This cognitive distortion would cause the individual to believe that their emotional response to a situation is a valid, objective trait of that situation. Considering the previous bear and the outdoor camping example, for a person who enjoys the occasional outdoor camping, the whole experience may seem safe, while for someone who has reservations regarding the outdoor activity, this may seem as a completely dangerous one. So, they would each define the activity based on their feelings about it, not the actual attributes of that context. Another example would be, I am afraid of flying on a plane. It's dangerous. The extended version would be, because I am afraid of flying on a plane, I consider it dangerous. It is important for us to discriminate between our feelings about something and their objective traits. Our conclusions should be primarily based on data. That will also allow a better regulation of our emotions. The unreasonable ticking clocks inside our minds. That is what should statements are. This type of cognitive distortion refers to the fact that we sometimes feel and think that we should respond in a positive manner to requests and norms that are not necessarily related to our inner structure or goals. It creates the illusion that individuals, and in the end the world, should be in a certain way. For example, you should be married by 30. A good friend should always help others. Or good kids are obedient, meaning that to be considered a good kid, you should be obedient. All these beliefs have the potential to manipulate us into doing something that has no meaning in the bigger picture of who we are, how we want to live, and what we want to achieve. They make us believe that we should submit to their content and act accordingly. The key in dealing with these cognitive distortions is to analyze the source and the relevance of the belief in relation to your goals. The source can be internal. You yourself created the deadline. The irrational link between objects or other elements that make up the belief. Or external. Family, friends, society. In this case, you need to analyze whether the belief holds any meaning for you. And if it doesn't, then you should assess whether to renounce those views and goals and overcome the emotions that may be attached to your decision of letting these views go. These feelings are usually guilt and shame, triggered by the idea that you have disappointed someone in your life and they perhaps hold you responsible for neglecting their wants. But we're not here to please others. We are here to live our own life, and as long as we cause no direct, deliberate harm to anyone, we are free to choose our own path. This basically cancels the idea of disappointment. People who may feel disappointment in reaction to your decisions may keep this feeling in their lives, but you don't have to feel any guilt in living your own life the way you feel you should. As for the self-imposed internal clocks, I should have kids by 35 or I should visit at least 25 countries in my lifetime, or similar thoughts, I recommend you eliminate the constraining factors, the shoulds, and the age limit, and reformulate the message you send to yourself in the following manner. I would like to have kids. The clock disappears. 
Of course, tell yourself that only if it is what you really want. Otherwise, modify the belief in the version that applies to you, or eliminate it altogether. Send yourself messages that are relevant to you. For the second example, you can reformulate, I would like to visit at least 25 countries. So now it is something about your wishes and preferences, not a must. This eliminates the pressure and allows you to enjoy the process of fulfilling your dream of travel. I would invite you to try to spot those unreasonable inner clocks and try to turn them off. Some may be easier to turn off than others, but remember to always pay attention to your emotional responses. They will usually guide you in the direction of tension and help you discover what you could analyze and deal with next. We do this all the time. Good job if you thought this is an overgeneralization. It could be, but I'll explain why it actually isn't. We use labels for almost everything in our lives. We assign words to objects, feelings, thoughts, etc. Those are labels. These labels are the basis of communication, and without them, we would have very limited options to convey our messages and discover things about the world around us. These are the good labels. But there are also bad labels. Labeling is a cognitive distortion that refers to assessing a person based on their behavior rather than their actual attributes. Behaviors refer to what a person does, not who a person is. So we need to make that distinction when we create our image about ourselves and others. For example, if someone reads a lot and engages in many scientific discussions, we may call this person a nerd. Nerd is the expression of cognitive distortion. Now, some of us take pride in being nerds. So in many cases, this particular cognitive distortion may not cause as much individual harm as other distortions, but nonetheless, it modifies the image we create in our mind about a person. We define them by what they do, not who they are. When used with the intention of harming someone, like name-calling, then the damage becomes easier to spot. Bullying incorporates labeling a lot. So, make sure that you pay attention to the attributes of a person, not their singular actions when defining them. This category of cognitive distortions is related to the way we may sometimes misattribute the source or the cause of a result. Personalization and blaming assign the effect to a single exclusive source or factor a factor that doesn't even have a significant role in the context we're analyzing. The difference between the two cognitive distortions lies in the nature of this source. When we assign the entire responsibility for a specific event to ourselves, then we call it personalization. And when we assign it to others, it's blaming. An example of personalization would be it's my fault that you didn't get the promotion. I could have done more. For blaming, we could formulate something along the lines of It's your fault that I'm mad. You never consider my feelings when you make decisions. The causes of an event are rarely singular, and the responsibility should rather be considered something shared by all the involved factors, with their respective amount of influence. This ends the section about cognitive distortions. Please go back and rewatch the lectures that address specific distortions when you analyze your own thinking patterns. And remember that we all get irrational thoughts once in a while, but it's in our power to diminish their effects and thus create a more valid inner image of ourselves, others, and the world we live in. Now, here is where the really fun part of this course begins. 
The following sections will address the methods of assertive communication, both its verbal and nonverbal elements. I will show you how to express your message in an authentic and confident way, how to offer constructive feedback, how to deal with criticism, and how to make it all come together with the use of nonverbal cues. In this section, we will address three main topics. How to assertively express your emotions. How to formulate your message in a non-passive, non-aggressive manner through the use of I statements. And how to say no and create the time for the goals and relationships that matter to you. I will see you in the next lecture. One of the most important skills in assertive communication is being able to express your emotions openly, directly, and unapologetically. Whether we're talking about positive or negative emotions, conveying them to others in a non-submissive, non-aggressive manner can make us feel more connected, more present in the relationship, and can generate the social support that we need. So, here is how to achieve this goal through assertive communication. First of all, simple is better most of the time. So, go for a simple sentence that starts with, I feel, and here's the catch. When you continue that sentence, make sure that you relate the emotional content to your own person, without placing responsibility for your feelings on others. So, keep to, I feel, this emotion. And don't say, you make me feel, this emotion. We bear the responsibility for our own emotions. Others bear responsibility for what they do or say. But how we react is in our field and in our power to modify. So, don't blame others for your negative emotions and do not cancel your positive feelings by linking them to an external source. You put them at risk of being taken away from you. You can additionally mention the source of your feelings. This is how I felt when, or the thoughts associated with them. My concern is that, I'm thinking that. And finally, if the source of your emotions is linked to the actions of another person, then convey that information objectively by referring to the exact context and its measurable features, again without assigning blame to the other one. An example of such structure would be When you were late for dinner for the second time this week, I felt this emotion and thought this means that and here you place your opinion. In assertive communication, I statements ensure most of the non-aggressive, non-passive character of your message. When you use I statements, you convey information about your own thoughts, opinions, and emotions, and show that you take full responsibility for them. This differentiates them from you statements, that convey information about the person receiving the message and are rather associated with assigning blame or responsibility. I statements are assertive forms of your message, while you statements are rather aggressive forms. The first show that you are in control of your own dynamic. The second give the control to external contexts. Assertiveness is linked to an internal sense of control. It may take you some time to learn how to properly formulate I statements and feel comfortable using them, but practice and careful analysis will help you master them. At the end of this lecture, I will share with you what I think is the most common mistake when it comes to formulating I statements. It refers to disguising a you statement in an I statement and expecting the results of the second. Since most I statements start with I feel, my opinion is, I wish, you may think that that beginning is enough for your message to be assertive. 
but the way you continue the statement may actually show that you are still not referring to your own person, but the other one. For example, you may say something like, My opinion is that you don't care enough about this relationship. You barely spend any time with me. And that's reproach. It's criticism. It's aggressive. And it does not convey anything about you, how you feel or what you think about the relationship. To make it an assertive message, you could say, My opinion is that couples can have a great time together. I wish we could spend more time with each other. Or, I enjoy our time together. I wish we could do that more often. Maybe even give some examples of the things you enjoy. If you say things in this manner, no blame is being assigned, and there's basically no need for the person you're talking to to become defensive or aggressive and dismiss your message. Communication can continue, and most likely, with I statements active, it will be on assertive terms. If your primary communication style is not assertive, then you may find it difficult to provide a negative response to requests that come from people who are close to you or whom you have invested with some kind of authority, at the workplace, for example. Saying yes to most or all the requests that come your way may take a great toll on your resources, such as time and energy, and it may also impact your self-esteem and confidence, among many other effects. To maintain control over these resources and use them for your own goals, it is important to learn how to say no. I imagine that some of you may now think, oh, okay, I will say no. That can't be all that hard. I need to stand up for myself. I'll say, you know what? I won't do this anymore. You're taking advantage of me. I'm done. Or you may think, it's correct. I say yes all the time and people do take advantage of me. I won't help anyone from now on. They should be able to manage their own business. And that would be a good first step, in the sense that you are willing to take action. But those would all be aggressive messages. To say no assertively and prevent people from taking advantage of your good nature, it is important for you to consider two significant aspects. One regards the reasons why you find it difficult to say no in the first place, and the second addresses the actual communication of your refusal. Let's first take a look at the main reasons why we find it sometimes hard to say no to certain requests, and then I will share with you the basic elements of formulating an assertive no. Some of the reasons why we find it hard to say no include the following thinking that we have no other options, thinking that we don't have the right to refuse, fear of being rejected, especially by people who are important to us, fear of potential conflict that may arise from saying no, the belief that good people always help others, the belief that others should not put you in uncomfortable positions, such as this one when you would have to refuse, we may also want to eliminate the responsibility for the consequences of our refusal. What if you say no and your colleague fails to complete a project and gets fired? And we may also find it hard to say no if our previous attempts have been less than successful. Perhaps our previous refusals were ignored or dismissed, and the person making the request assumed and expected us to solve a task anyway. The assertive truth is that we should be able to say no to those requests that we consider unreasonable, and our response should be acknowledged. Here are my recommendations on formulating an assertive no. Remind yourself that you have the right to say no, even if you have the resources to respond positively to a request. Make sure that whatever you include in your message complies with the main assertive principle of not infringing on other people's rights. Keep in mind that you don't have to always say yes to requests that come your way. You can select the situations in which you want to get involved. 
define for yourself what an unreasonable request is. Formulate the limits that once crossed would turn the request into an unreasonable one. These are individual limits. What seems reasonable to you may not seem reasonable to someone else. Use the proper nonverbal communication to support your verbal message. Take time to make your decision. Make sure you have all the data you need in order to make an informed decision. Be sure that that is the message you want to convey and communicate it with confidence. You can prepare your message beforehand. Write down the outline or the entire message. This will prevent the situation in which your anxiety could cause you to forget significant parts of it or influence your delivery. You can offer justification for your refusal, but you don't have to. Also, you don't necessarily have to say you're sorry. We mainly offer our apologies when our actions directly impact another person in a negative way. Just because we cannot help everybody all the time does not necessarily justify that. Don't become defensive, even though the other person may blame you and try to make you feel guilty. Again, you have the right to say no, even when the situation benefits you as well, or primarily benefits you. If your message is either dismissed or ignored, repeat your message. The next section of the course will give you information about the specific assertive technique that you can use in this sense. Also, remember that people only need to acknowledge your refusal, not agree with it. They are responsible for their own reactions to your assertively formulated refusal. Your message is valid even if people do not agree with it. My final tip here is that in this case, just like with every other assertive message, you need to take responsibility for your part of the communication and accept its results. In this section of the course, I will cover three main assertive verbal communication techniques. The broken record, the free information, and the self-disclosure technique. They will help you convey your message in a powerful manner, when the other person is either ignoring or trying to dismiss it, and they will also ensure an optimal flow of information. The free information and self-disclosure techniques also provide a way to assess whether the social interaction occurring between two persons or in a group is indeed assertive communication. They will basically indicate the level of engagement of the individuals involved in the communication. The broken record is one of the most effective assertive communication techniques that you can start using right now in order to convey your message. You can use this method in those situations where your message seems to be either ignored or denied by the other person. The broken record is all about being persistent. Just like a music record that once scratched may get stuck at a certain point in the song and would go on and on repeating the same part over and over again, you can repeat the significant part of your message. Now, some trainers may tell you that it is necessary to repeat the exact same phrase over and over again, but that is not the case. All you need to do is to make sure that you repeat the core, the significant portion of what you want to convey, and you can modify the rest. When using the broken record technique or any other assertiveness technique, you need to make sure that you say what you want to say without becoming furious and without raising your voice. You need to make your voice heard, not turn it into an overpowering element of the conversation. That would be aggressive behavior. Use the broken record technique when the person you're talking to is either ignoring your message or trying to dismiss it. Use it to fight those contexts of conversational manipulation in which the other individual may try to introduce auxiliary, redundant topics that may distract you from formulating or stating your authentic opinion. Remember that the broken record is all about being persistent 
and not giving up on saying what you need to say. This technique refers to information given to us freely by others. It's information we never requested and upon which we do not comment. We simply listen to what the other one decided to share with us. Free information creates and maintains a safe and supportive environment in which authentic communication can occur. To activate the benefits related to this technique, we need to pay attention and carefully listen to what the other person is sharing and use this information in further communication segments to show that the message reached its target. This will make communications flow smoothly. It's a technique that is really easy to use if you are already a good listener, but it can also help you exercise your active listening skills. To communicate efficiently, it is important to be able to clearly convey your message and carefully listen to what others are sharing about themselves, but that is not all there is to it. For communication to be a success, we need to remind ourselves that we are an important part of that context and that we need to provide information about ourselves as well. The other one will get to know us, the communication will deepen and thus develop. Without this element, communication resembles an investigation, where one part is asking the questions and the other one is just providing the answers. That type of interaction does not allow growth to happen. The assertive relationship cannot be built on this ground. Both parts need to disclose information about themselves and receive relevant information about the other one. Now, self-disclosure does not imply that we should share everything about ourselves with others. We get to choose what is comfortable to share in each type of interaction and what we keep to ourselves at all times. But sharing information that is comfortable for you to share will raise the level of intimacy, support, and connection between yourself and the people you cherish and want in your life. The way we provide and receive feedback, especially when its content is rather unfavorable or negative, is an important part of assertive communication. Providing our positive opinion or praise comes to many of us easier than letting someone know that we are not satisfied with the work they are doing, for example. When communicating in an assertive way, we need to make sure that we share these opinions in a way that complies with the assertive principles and does not infringe on the rights of others. At the same time, we ourselves need to display an assertive reaction to negative feedback. Criticism and conflict are normal occurrences in our lives, many times the second being the direct result of how the first was offered. Conflict may arise from criticism if the essence of it is not relationship regulation and growth. So, learning how to deal with these two aspects of life in an assertive manner is a critical point in assertiveness training, and the results can truly shape your relationships and help you achieve your goals. In the following lectures, I will show you how to formulate negative feedback and how to deal with criticism in an assertive manner. saying that we are not happy with certain aspects of our personal or professional relationships may be difficult for many people. But if we want to build authentic relationships, this is something that must be done. In the assertive communication context, messages that contain justified negative feedback are known under the label of constructive criticism. Because criticism, when it comes to assertive communication, is not meant to hurt, disempower, or put down the other individual, but to help them grow and improve their skills, and in the end, improve the relationship and the positive mutual effects. This is why we need to learn how to provide constructive feedback, 
so that our relationships can move forward. So here are some tips on how to do that. First of all, you need to try to make yourself comfortable with the idea of providing negative feedback in the first place. When you do this in an assertive way, you are being authentic. You're not bullying anyone, and others should be able to handle this type of message, especially when it's given with the goal of making things better. So tell yourself that it is okay to express your dislikes about the context or someone's actions. Which brings me to the next tip. Always make sure that you refer to someone's actions, their observable behaviors, not the actual person. Constructive feedback is not about who they are, but what they do and the results of those actions. Constructive criticism is justified criticism. That means it refers to something observable, measurable, and most of all, something that can be improved. If the object of your criticism is not something that can be modified, then that is not justified criticism. It needs to allow development, and fixed traits do not allow that. Criticizing fixed traits is aggressive, not assertive behavior. Carefully choose the context in which you provide constructive feedback. Some messages are only relevant to one person or specific group of individuals, so make sure that you do not turn the moment from something well-intended to a context of public humiliation or embarrassment for the other one. Some trainers recommend a specific structure for messages that fall in the constructive feedback category, but I do not necessarily endorse any specific form of it. However, I do recommend adding a positive aspect to your message, something you observed the other one does well, or a reference to one of the skills they master. This element does help communication and shows that you are also paying attention to the good things and you're not just after mistakes or things that go wrong. Opening your message with positive feedback works best and outlines the context as a supportive one. Be specific. Make your feedback about a specific action or context, not about a general observation. Provide examples of the actions you're referring to. Do not give advice. Constructive feedback is about information, not advice. The other one may ask for your recommendations later on, and then you may agree to provide them. But constructive criticism is just about observed actions and what makes them less than acceptable or satisfying. It's about why they need to be addressed, not how. The other one can choose whether to modify that behavior or not, and if they decide to change it, they themselves can find a way to achieve that. Offering advice you were never asked for is aggressive, not assertive and supportive. When you communicate your constructive feedback, use a calm, balanced tone of your voice. You should be confident and supportive, and that can be done from an aggressive stance. My last tip on the topic of constructive criticism is to use I statements and emphasize the benefits of that specific change. That will convey that your message comes from a good, supportive place and will make the other person more receptive of what you have to say. Justified or not, we will at times receive negative feedback ourselves. If it's justified, then it's the constructive feedback we've addressed previously. If it lacks the characteristics of that form of feedback, then it's just an aggressive message that comes our way. Nonetheless, we need to be able to deal with both forms of negative feedback, without letting the intensity of emotions overwhelm us and without escalating a conflict. That is the basic way in which the assertive method manages criticism. We remain calm or experience moderate levels of negative emotions, keep our confidence and self-esteem, and do not respond in an aggressive way, 
which can transform communication that is only moderately unpleasant into open conflict. The assertive communication techniques that I will talk to you about in the next lectures are fogging, negative inquiry, and negative investigation. They will prepare you to deal with most forms of criticism that occur in your personal and professional life. Fogging is most useful when dealing with manipulation. When criticism is offered in a manipulative way, it is important to be aware of both our emotional reactions and our verbal and nonverbal communication. Usually we may respond to psychological manipulation with emotions such as anxiety, panic, or go into defensive mode. These would be passive responses. Or you could go the aggressive way and counterattack. But you can also use the fogging technique. Here is how. Do not deny the critical message and agree to the truth contained, be it partial or total. If the criticism is fully justified, then agree to what's being criticized. You are correct. I arrived late again for the team meeting. And you can stop there. You do not have to justify why you are late. If the criticism involves the chances of something occurring in the future, like you being fired if you will continue to practice tardiness, you can agree to that possibility. You may be right. That might happen. Or, if the manipulative criticism is formulated in a logical manner, something like Managers should be examples for the other team members. If you continue to be late, you may lose the great professional image you have in this company. Then agree to the general principle the message refers to. You are right, that makes sense. I will try to set or remain a good example for the team. So remember not to get defensive, don't offer justifications, and don't react aggressively. Accept the critical message partially, completely, or in principle, and that should discourage the person criticizing you to continue the communication in the same way, since they do not get what they want, an intense emotional reaction, defensiveness, or an outburst. When things settle, you may try to address the core situation in an assertive, constructive way. This is a technique you can use when the criticism you receive is justified. When you know your actions were less than desirable and there was some error on your part. First of all, you need to accept the fact that we all make mistakes, no matter how skilled, how well intended and how assertive we are in general, we will make mistakes, big or small, significant or not. Mistakes are inherent facts of life. So, get comfortable to the idea that you are not perfect, no one is, and that is okay. Some professionals say that since that is something that happens to all of us, we could even eliminate the concept of mistake from our minds, because its negative connotation triggers negative emotional responses, like guilt or lowers our self-esteem level each time we repeat it in our inner speech. I think we can keep the label, especially for technical contexts, when you can actually follow an algorithm and pinpoint the step where we acted in a way that triggered a less than desirable result. But I believe we should change our emotional response to it. I think we should desensitize ourselves to the idea of mistake in the technical environment. In the personal, subjective contexts, where usually there is no right or wrong way to do most of the things, then maybe there we can substitute the concept of mistake with less than desirable action, or something similar since our action was just different, and in that context it did not trigger the expected outcome. But there's nothing wrong about it, and knowing and accepting that 
will eliminate the unnecessary feeling of guilt from those contexts. You can choose the method that you feel fits you best. To eliminate the idea of mistake altogether from your inner vocabulary or not, but I will also provide here the short version of my explanation of why I don't necessarily endorse the complete elimination of the concept. Guilt is, in my opinion, a human emotion and I do not think that we should consider any of the human or animal emotions redundant. I think they are valuable in the regulation of inner and social dynamics. We can learn to use them better not let them overwhelm us, but I believe that we should not try to completely eliminate types of feelings or the expression of any of them. It's what makes us us, and we should be reading into the message and opportunities they contain. And this is what the negative assertion technique is all about, accepting those parts of us that are not our strengths. We cannot be good at everything, and we can't always perform at our best levels even when we master a certain skill. So we should be comfortable with this idea and express it assertively. You could say something like, I know, that wasn't my best speech during a meeting. Just agree that it wasn't your best moment. Don't define yourself through that singular situation. That would be the negative filter bias we've addressed earlier. And don't seek forgiveness in this context. If you haven't infringed on someone's rights, then there are no deliberate or direct negative effects of your actions upon others. It just is what it is. Now let's move on to the final verbal assertive communication technique presented in this course. Negative inquiry. Negative inquiry is an assertive communication technique that you can use when the critical message is based on dichotomous thinking when it's related to things being right or wrong, good or bad, etc. This technique, although it can be used in most contexts, formal or informal, it works best in personal environments, because it opens up the communication to topics such as preferences, likes and dislikes, and allows us to find the middle ground, where to meet the other one and improve the relationship. To use the negative inquiry technique, simply ask for details about what is being criticized to receive more specific feedback and continue the assertive communication. Let's say a family member tells you something along the lines of, you look horrible today. Don't react emotionally to the criticism and ask, is it the way I look or the way I'm dressed? This question is meant to work like a filter and turn the general into specific, and that you can use to better understand the message included in the critique, and continue an assertive, balanced communication. The negative inquiry technique marks the end of the assertive verbal communication technique section of our course. We now have one final place to visit before we end, at least for now, this journey in the realm of assertiveness training. And that is the nonverbal assertive communication lecture. See you there. Although we may be inclined to believe that verbal communication is what matters exclusively when it comes to successful communication, we must be aware of the fact that nonverbal communication is just as important in conveying our authentic messages. Verbal communication refers to the words that make up our message. Nonverbal communication is about additional elements, other than words, that complete the message. These elements, some of which we've already covered in the lectures about each of the communication styles, include posture, gestures, facial expressions, or voice traits. Nonverbal communication supports the message conveyed verbally and nuances the transmission in a way that facilitates understanding. What we say is just as important as how we say it. So here are some of the nonverbal characteristics of assertive communication. Nonverbal assertive communication, just like verbal communication, conveys respect and consideration for your own person as well as others. The most important aspect of nonverbal communication 
is that it should transmit the same message as the verbal communication. When the two lack synchronization, the message may be seen as mixed. Delivery may be associated with a lack of confidence or credibility. One may choose to focus exclusively on one aspect of the message being conveyed, the verbal or nonverbal one, and that may trigger misunderstanding and conflict. So make sure that the two forms of communication match, especially when it comes to facial expressions. The assertive posture means you stand or sit up straight. Your shoulders and hips should define a vertical plane. Eye contact is direct most of the time, but interrupted by occasional horizontal eye movements, so that it won't be perceived as confrontational as we see in the aggressive style. The whole body should face the person or group of persons that you're communicating with. Gestures and movements should be relaxed and natural. Fluidity in movement makes communication come together. Pay close attention and consider the cultural variations when it comes to personal space, the distance between the people who communicate, whether touch is allowed by the context and type of relationship, etc. When you speak assertively, use a calm tone of your voice and maintain word frequency throughout the communication. As a last tip, Keep in mind that assertiveness is all about authenticity, so your nonverbal communication should match your inner structure, your beliefs, your feelings, the image you want to project into the world, and the relationships you want to successfully build with others. Here we are at the end of our course. I hope that by now you have a more clear view about the main elements of assertive communication, its cognitive foundations, and specific techniques available to you, and also that you've tried to implement some of the techniques in your own life or at least imagined what that would be like. Perhaps now you can see better what assertiveness can do for your independence and the independence of others. For your goals, your aspirations, and your relationships. Remember that assertiveness may not always get you what you want, but most of the time will provide you with what you need. My final recommendations include my invitation to practice the assertive ways until they will be fully assimilated as the primary thinking and communication style, and they will activate automatically when needed. I would also like to convey to you not to get discouraged when things do not turn in the communication world the way you want to, and keep confidence in the fact that your assertive traits are already part of you, and if this is your goal, you will bring them to the surface and enjoy the benefits they bear. It was a pleasure for me to create and make this course available to you. It brings me joy that you decided and committed to making these significant changes in your life, and I confidently believe that attitudes like yours and mine will bring about the global environment of safety, trust, and mutual support that we need to thrive as individuals and as a society. Thank you. Congratulations on completing the Assertive Communication Build Independent You course. Thank you all for taking this journey with me. I hope that during this course, you've gained insight regarding your own inner and social dynamics and the tools that you can use to better your life. Change is not easy. The process is challenging and demands many resources. Remember that this is a step-by-step -step process and results will appear gradually in your life as you implement and better your communication techniques. And that is exactly how the world around you will change as well. I would love to read your feedback, assertive feedback if possible, about this course and your experience with it. Also, feel free to check out my other online courses. The following titles are available on the platform.
You can also visit my website, psychologycorner.com, and discover even more personal development resources. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.